It was a dream to return to the world of Dune. I've never gotten a return to a project before. Uh, so this was not only returning to castmates that I uh, had a beautiful working experience with the first time, it was also getting to see characters expand, like Chani, getting to work with new, uh, super talented actors like Austin Butler, Florence Pugh, I'd done a film with before. So this was, a, this was an absolute dream come true. And uh, getting to see Denis um, bring his full vision to life. Obviously when he from wrote the first movie, he had written them together with the idea of doing two parts. So uh, the first film was a, a litmus test. It was sort of a, uh, a thesis on getting the right to do a second movie. I've been, you know, wishing and dreaming and, and thinking about what it would be like. And I mean, it absolutely surpasses any kind of dream I could have ever had. It's, you know, being on these sets with these incredibly talented people, and that's, you know, in every department. Um, I, yeah, I'm in awe. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, like again, landing on Arrakis. It's a, it's, a real, it's a real place, it feels like. We pick up Chani, I guess, you know, like I said, right where we left off, she's just met this foreigner who, uh, who, you know, I guess there have been years and years of propaganda that has been pushed upon the Fremen many of which believe that there is a messiah that is supposed to come and save them. And, you know, I think what Denny has done so, so beautifully in, in these films is really make a distinction between, um, I think, the, 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 the older generation and the younger generation, which I think is something we kind of deal with in our own society and our own kind of issues and confrontations we deal with now is just like, there is a new generation of people that are able to see things with a completely different lens and a completely different um, set of rules, right? And really throwing them out and saying, this is, this is the world I wanna live in and I wanna be a part of it. And so she's part of that generation that's really fighting back against these kind of archaic, um, you know, ideas that she just is like, this is what has been oppressing my people. This is, I'm against this, this doesn't work for me. Um, and so I think the entire kind of journey for her is sensing a sincerity and um, an honestness and a um, openness to learn and grow from Paul. And that's like really <laughs> quite, you know, um, I don't know, it's, it's hard for her to, to, uh, to digest because she has these feelings of wanting to trust him and, and falling in love with someone, but also hating what they represent at the same time. And I think that that's really, really difficult for her because she cares about her people, I think, more than anything. You know, she just wants what's, what's best for, um, for her, her, her community, the people that she loves, the planet that she loves. She has such a strength um, that I admire um, and such a passion for the betterment of her people and looking out for her people and, and taking care of um, her loved ones um, and her planet which means more to her than anything. So, um, you know, I love very hard as well. <laughs> and, um, you know, I like to think that in whatever I do, um, I have a much easier job than she does because <laughs> I am not a space warrior. Um, but I think in whatever I do, I, I do try to do it with the best um, sense of heart and integrity, and I, I, I want to lead with what I feel like is right, not just for myself, but for the people around me. Um, and so I think that that is something, integrity, I think is a massive word for her. The sets are so, I mean, like stunning. Like the detail, the attention to detail when you walk into the siege and you see all the inscriptions of uh, the prophecy on the walls, you know, it's like, the, the, the time it takes to make something like this, I can't imagine. So I really think that <clears throat> my job then becomes easy. I step on set, I have this incredible costume that already changes your physicality, you know, uh, hair and makeup that does the same. And then I step into a set where I feel like I'm already on a different planet. So uh, 
that does, you know, half the job, and then I just gotta figure out how to speak <laughs> in Chicopsa. <laughs> Patrice, our production designer, did, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure he won an Oscar for the first one, <clears throat> and uh, he matched, if not exceeded, his work here. Once more, the first movie felt a little bit like uh, an experimental thesis on what could be brought to life in a second one, both by Patrice and Greg Frazier and Denis, and uh, the sets were awe-inspiring. We had a working relationship here, but as you said, it was only like three, four days, so it was more from the friendship that had grown in the years since the first movie and second movie were shot and uh, just a wonderful experience to get to work with the actress she's become and, um, and you know, producerially and creatively she's firing on all cylinders so it was, she was a real partner in crime. Um, just tracking our relationship through the film and and I'm, as I'm sure I'll talk about a million times in the coming year, I hope, you know, just a wonderful friend. We didn't really know each other at all before the first film. And then over the span of the years that it took to come out and, um, and after, we became very close. And now he's like, he's like my brother. He's like family to me. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm grateful to have this experience with someone who, again, who feels like, like family. You know, we get to, to look around and have these experiences and like, wow, how cool is that? You know, someone you know you're gonna be friends with for a long time and just be able to, I mean, I hope we're like Javier and Josh who, <laughs> you know, they're sitting and they're, you know, they're like, uh, we, we call like, they're like big kids. And they sit around and they talk about, hey, remember when we made this movie together and remember this and remember that? So hopefully we'll have the same kind of thing on Dune 12, you know? The most spoiled cast additions ever. Um, you know, Suyella, amazing French actress uh, who plays, um, who plays uh, Shishakli and uh, Lea Seydoux, who's one of my favorite actresses and from Blue's Warmest Color and I've been dying to work with for years and she just brings in a regality and an excellence and uh, and uh, just scariness to to the um, to the Lady Fenring role. Florence Pugh is amazing in this movie. Uh, Austin Butler is extraordinary as Fade Rautha. I mean, really extraordinary. We did a cast Zoom in July or something, and he sounded like Stellan. And like Zendaya and I were joking about it afterwards because people were just kind of reading through the script on the Zoom, and then Austin started doing his thing, and everyone kind of like. <laughs> Everyone started acting with the camera more, you know, um, and uh, and then Christopher Walken, King of New York. It's amazing, you know, the the Emperor of the Universe, is, the King of New York, is confronted by a young man from New York. So I guess all roads do go through New York, you know. No, but um, <laughs> I only got a few days getting to watch Mr. Walken, which was crazy. I was so nervous. I I, I barely even talked to him, you know. I was just like. Hi, sir, you know, like, uh, but you know, his presence just walking in the room, you're like, Whoa, you know, so he feels like an emperor for sure. Um, but yeah, watching that, I mean, Florence was so lovely and kind. And again, I didn't get to spend as much time as I wish we had, but um, had such like a regal, natural sense of just like being Princess Irulan. She was meant to be Princess Irulan, you know. Um, and then Austin, who brought this, like, who is a lovely, kind person, but has somehow transformed into this, like, evil, terrifying, you know, beast. Um, yeah, so I think this, I mean, it, it goes without saying, like, this cast is really, really, really special, and the new players are bringing so much to this film, and I'm excited to see it all put together. I mean, Florence Pugh is extraordinary in this movie. She's extraordinary in every movie she's in, but she brought something, a steeliness, a fierceness, uh, a gumption to uh, this role that is uh, just, in just incredible and sort of just inspiring to be working with her on the day. I got to do an another film with her where we also play ill-fated <laughs> lovers at the end, but uh, she just, Florence is just the rare artist and actress who just comes to life on screen and in real life, obviously, for anybody who's hung out with her is, is uh, exponential. But um, 
Um, also, she's once more, she's a great spirit. She was beloved by the creative team and by uh, Greg Frazier and Denis before I even got there on this one. Um, and just an incredible actress, a very hard worker, and uh, just brought something very special to this movie. Yeah. It was quite possibly the most thrilling welcome to a world I think I've ever experienced and probably ever will experience. You know when you watch all of the behind the scenes of those mega worlds, whether it's like Star Wars or uh, even like Jane, but like any, any of those mega worlds that you're walking into, um, I've always seen the behind pictures and like seen all the costumes and seen all the designers at work as someone's about to walk onto set and always wondered like, ooh, I wonder if they'll ever make those epics again. And then obviously Dune 1 came out and it truly was and is an epic and so yeah, joining it has been huge and being able to walk onto the sets and being able to be a part of Denise's imagination is, um, it's quite an experience. Joining a cast as, as epic as this is, um, is always something that you always want to get involved with. And then of course my character is, um, she's very brooding, she's very, um, she's very quiet in the way that she watches the storyline. And at first glance, you could think that maybe she wasn't quite aware of what's going on, but she's always there and she's always calculating. And those are always characters that I um, are drawn to. Um, there's so much possibility with a character that's watching. And um, even though Denis kept on telling me, the character's quite small, it's quite small, I, I just want you to be aware. And I was like, I don't, I don't mind that. It's, that's even more exciting. That's, that's more of a challenge. Truly, it's, uh, I feel such comfort around him. I think when we worked together, it's almost like four years ago now, on Little Women, um, that was one of, a, like, one of my first really big like, movies <laughs> with really big actors. Um, and uh, I remember feeling very small in comparison to the, the, the machine that that was. You know, just the Meryl Streep, t a Timmy. A Timmy had exploded over like literally four months, five months beforehand, that year beforehand. And, um, and I remember being so um, like bow down to him all the time. And on this one, I can just see how much he's grown and how much, how much of an actor he is he was before, but like, to be able to see your friend kind of step up to the challenge of being not only an incredible actor, but also hold a set and, and, and hold a, a room and hold a movie is uh, such a, a feeling of pride, even if, I, if I'm allowed to have that feeling. <laughs> um, and I love working with him. He's, he's a big teddy bear. I was a huge fan of the first film and a massive fan of Denise and uh, he's just a genius. So. It's, uh, it's been just the time of my life getting to come here and everybody's welcomed me with open arms and uh, I'm so excited about it. As soon as I read the script and, and spoke to Denis, I knew that it was gonna be so much fun. It was, you don't get to play characters like this every day. Uh, and on top of that, it was the challenge involved. It was the physical transformation. And, uh, Denis, as soon as we talked about Fade, he, he kind of, he described to me his image of how he saw him and uh, and how physically imposing he wanted him to be, and um, and so I knew that there was going to be there was going to be a good challenge in that, and it was also just getting into his psychology. It's it's sort of it can be those are the characters that can be hard to justify their actions, um, but yet humanity is full of those types of people. So uh, so shining a light on that part of the human condition is is a fascinating thing to explore. I just loved the world. It, it sucked me right in, and um, I, I wasn't, I didn't see as many of the, the, uh, the parallels to the, what's happening in our culture. And, and I mean, the book was written uh, many years ago, so it, you kind of you, you look at it, and it feels so modern in the way of dealing with the corruption and the lies in the world and. Um, people greedy for power and, um, and and just all the parallels that we have today but I didn't see that when I was 15 and then I reread the book and and uh, and then saw all these things I didn't see the first time well for one Denise an incredible writer uh, 
he, he understands story and um, and humanity and, and is able to layer it really well. Um, but on top of that, he writes in a very visual way. So that, in combination with the fact that I'd seen the first film and I knew his visual style and I knew what Hans Zimmer's score was going to sound like, it was a very immersive experience. You don't often get that when you're reading a script where you feel like you're already watching the movie, so I definitely felt that. Denis had a... He had an, he had an image of, of fate physically that he described to me, um, but a lot of the, the, the reasons why and, um, and uh, fate's childhood and th those sorts of things, that, that, those were the bits that Denis had... Um, he, we, we had more conversations about him, figuring out why does fate act the way he does. What was what was his relationship like with his mother and his brother and his uncle and um, who did he look up to when he was growing up and um, so that that led into um, finding Fade's voice and uh, which which was you know sort of came out of this this idea of living with the Baron from a very young age and and seeing that that. Th this is the man who has power. This is this is um, this ends up being in this brutal world where you're leading with fear rather than love. Um, who do you look up to, and and who do you emulate? And uh, that's where that came from. Dune Part Two begins sort of where the first one leaves off. Paul's. Life has been shattered. His family, as as and so many people that he loved, uh, has been uh, killed, and and he's he's been um, now on this journey to uh, one avenge his father and to um, to to unite with Johnny and and the Fremen to reclaim their land, and uh, so that's the journey. Uh, forward and doing too. Florence is, she's one of the greatest actresses that we have right now and um, and she's so she's so powerful and able to be have such power and subtlety and um, and uh, and then we also have a, a great time together on set and um, she's been uh, She's just been such a joy to get to be around. We, we really have had so much fun. He's a fantastic actor and um, and a really generous guy. And um, uh, we've had we've had a blast together so far. And um, it it can be it can be tough, you know, when you when you're doing physical fight scenes and because uh, you have to have a rapport with the other person and it's like you're dancing together. So. Uh, he's been a great dancing partner this time. <laughs> Anytime I go on a new set, I feel like I'm, like it's the first day of school, and and yeah, I'm always nervous, and uh, especially when you're coming into a film that's already been established before. Um, but everybody here has been, uh, they're just such a great group of people. It feels like a family, and very quickly. I felt like I was just welcomed into the family. And, um, the entire crew is just the best in the business, and I, uh, I feel incredibly fortunate that, that I'm getting to be a part of it with all of them. You know, it's the same book, and that's what people get confused by. So this is another book. No, that was, and I think it's the smartest thing that Denis did was say, let's break this up, you know, and not overwhelm people with too much information. And it, it allows for, for quiet, and it allows for... I don't know, for lack of a better word, spiritual kind of growth that he's going through, that Paul's going through. But at this point, you don't know. You don't know what's happened. You don't know who's still alive. You don't know who died in the first one, whether it's me, whether it's everybody. So you get these people, you know, re-coalescing and having these incredible emotional reactions to each other. And then ultimately, I think the first half was more of an introductory story. Whereas I think this is about somebody truly growing into 
maturity. And it's something that we can all identify with because it happens earlier for some, later for others. But it's like the power of your own individuality at what, you know, what process do you go through in order to accept that and, and, uh, and live in the integrity of who you are. And we're all unique. You know what I mean? And like some people have that ability, that, that power to, uh, I don't know, to engage or power to attract or something like that. And some people don't have that. And you watch Paul struggle through all this stuff and you have to go through all this kind of pain in order to self-reflection and all that to get there. But when he finally gets there, it's, it's a special moment. It's about a boy graduating into manhood. It's about a human being becoming fully themselves um, and that it's not a lonely it's it can be a um, lonely lonely process but you're not alone because it takes a village do you know what I mean and you don't realize that until you you've arrived so yeah all these characters I think more than any other story I've ever been involved with all these characters are essential to his um, coming to terms with himself. She's one of the coolest people I've ever met. You know, I've seen a couple of her films. Mm -hmm. You know, she, which I always like seeing, she's fun. She has a lot of energy. She's like got a lot of adolescent energy and it's great. And then you see these movies where she can tap into emotion at will. And it's very, very powerful, psychically powerful, emotionally powerful. Um, I have a lot of respect for that woman. When somebody's a good actor and they bring little subtleties, so like we were doing a scene and you know, all of us are, are subject to kind of being out of character at times, you know, and, and, and then you're reminded that's what a good director's for to go, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, you know are you in Hawaii? Like, where are you? And, and then you go back into these idiosyncrasies that you developed before you started and some work and some don't and then you refine it with the director and all that. And Javier slows everything down. He did this great, it was a great character choice. And I, so we were doing the scene together and, I, and, I, and he did it a couple of times and I was like, and then, that's not Stilgar. And then there was a tweak and then he went into this place and it's just like listening to Hans's music. It's like something just flows perfectly and you're like, that's the perfect character for this guy. Like nobody could play this better than him right now. Yeah, so he's, he's great. He's very rare, man. He's a very rare individual, you know. Um, I have I, I, I have a crazy, crazy amount of respect for him. And and I love him as a human being, you know. And his you know, watch him direct, you know, and you have your technical expertise or your skills and all that, and then you have an ability to see a story all the way through. And then you have another ability, which usually you don't find all of them in the same director, of being able to demand more of your actors in a way that truly works for your film, as opposed to throwing ego at somebody because you're the director and you want to have an impact. There is something that he is going for that we all trust, that ultimately, even though I may argue with him sometimes, that ultimately is going to make a better film. It's always kind of a luxury uh, returning to a, you know, a film, a sequel, uh, you know, a trilogy. <laughs> You're coming. It feels like, uh, I don't know, it feels familiar. It feels comfortable. Um, I had such a good experience. Well, I've always had a, such a good experience working with Denise, so I, uh, I always look forward to it instead of getting my typical jitters because I'm nervous about everything I do, everything, even like auditions. I, I still, you know, I've been doing this for years, but I still get nervous and have anxiety about it. But it's just, uh, it's just more comforting, you know, kind of picking up where you left off. And that's how it felt. I felt like I was picking up where I left off. Ur Urban, in part one, he kind of, uh, He's given a full go-ahead, um, full authority to kind of run things the way he sees fit, which are which are not good. <laughs> you know, if you know anything about him, he's just he's just a brute and he's a psychopath. He's a murderer, and, and that's how he rules. He rules with with anger and fear, and, and so uh, you know that's where we left off with him, just getting you know the go-ahead, the green light to run things uh, his way, and we pick up 
uh, with his way not going very well. <laughs> You know, they just, I don't, I think he underestimates uh, everything he's up against and, uh, you know, brute power with not a lot of brains behind it. It's not going to get you very far. <laughs> but I, I think that's, that's a pickup, uh, seeing him and seeing Raban kind of fall to pieces because of it. I think all of his, all of his insecurities are kind of shining through in, in part two. And you really see uh, the nature of him, you know, that he is a, you know, he's a bully and he's a coward. And, uh, but that's how he gets by on his intimidation and fear and anger. And, uh, and it's just not working out for him. I mean, you love people and you appreciate their talent, but then when you get to know people and see that they're also, they don't take that for granted or they don't hold it over anybody's head. They don't, you know, their noses aren't in the air. They're just grounded. They're just like good, just normal people. Then you appreciate them even more. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know how it happened, but it, there seems to be a cast full of those people here. <laughs> Well, for one, he's just he's just brilliant. I mean, I just love this kid. So his performance, I was I've been watching his performance, and it's kind of you know this is again this is such a luxury of being a part of a film like this because you get to step back and you get to watch uh, really brilliant actors like do their thing, and this is like this is what I love about it because for me it's an ed education. Like this is how I learn. I'm an on-the-job learning actor. So when I get to watch other actors like perform and just uh, through little subtleties. Um, become so interesting to the camera. It's really, like, it's amazing to me. I get to watch it. I got a front seat, you know, for this front row seat. But um, Austin is, he's just, he's just a very interesting actor. And he's just embraced his character. And I've only seen him in a couple other things. And they're so different from what he's doing now. And that's when you really kind of realize how talented people are. But the thing I love about us, Austin uh, the most is, again, he's, you know, I don't know, I, and I hope he never realizes, but I don't think he realizes um, what a star he is now. His star, his trajectory is just, it's off the charts. And you know that this kid is going to be something like, he's going to be on top of the world in, you know, in a year or two, especially. I, I said to Timmy, uh, Timothy Chalamet, before this, uh, the first film came, down, came out, I said, I asked him if he was ready for this because he had achieved a certain amount of success. But I was like, this film is going to turn you into a massive star. And I think I, you know, I can pat myself on the back and say that I was right. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's not like, you know, everybody knew it. I mean, everybody knew he was, he was headed there. Um, I just wonder, you know, I always, I'm always curious of how it will affect people, especially if people so young. So again, I think with Austin, you, you look at him and you see this kid. He's such a shining star. He's so brilliant, so talented. And you wonder how he'll be affected because you know that he's getting ready to be one of the biggest stars in the world. And I think he's, you know, he's kind of, he's, he's already there, he's scratching the surface, but I think this film is gonna be, you know, it's gonna put him on a different level. I think with any job, especially when you're performing, if you're close to the people that you're working with, it's just gonna be an easier experience and it's gonna be no pressure. I also think that, you know, that's kind of the way you build chemistry with people. That's the way you connect, when you're just comfortable with people. Because if you're clashing, it just, there's never any chemistry. But I think if you're, if you have a, a good energy, uh, you know, especially if you have like a, a love for the people that you're working with, it's just there is just a connection there that it translates on the film. And I think that's, you know, this is why I always, when I say that people are so down to earth and you feel comfortable with them, it's like, it, it's not an understatement. Like it helps, it just helps in your performance because you don't have to be self-conscious and actors, no matter what they tell you, they're the most self-conscious people <laughs> on the face of the earth. And me, like, it's, it's tenfold. I can't even bring myself to watch playbacks because I will harp on them and I will just pick out one thing that I do wrong and it will just ruin my day because I can't think of anything else. Um, and I'll feel like, you know, this person next to me, they have saw it, they know it, they think I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> and it'll just, it just eats me up, but it's just, it's just my nature. Uh, but with everybody I'm working with, I just don't have to feel that. And this, you know, I'm just speaking personally. I don't know how everybody else would process this. But for me to be comfortable with the people that I'm working with is, is everything. Um, so I don't, I don't feel like there's a competition. I feel like uh, people are making a, bringing the best out of each other, you know, instead of competing with each other. And that's what it feels like with all these strong actors. I love Stellan. <laughs> I love Stellan. Stellan, he's really, he's a man after my own heart because he, he's like, he's such a good actor and he's so respected and I have him on such a sped, uh, pedestal. But he is, um, he never takes himself too seriously. And I kind of learned that 
Um, I learned that a little bit while we were filming, and then I saw him at a Golden Globes party, and he really, he really embraced me, and I was, sh I was shocked because I, I just admire him so much. He's uh, one of those persons that I, one of those people that I, I, I can't believe that I have, have his respect, but I know he does. He's told me he really respects me, and, and he loved my performance in the first film, so it's a bit surreal to me. Um, but I really learned on our press tour when we were, um, when we were headed into uh, Venice Film Festival how just lighthearted and how funny he is with a sense of humor. And his sense of humor, you know, sometimes you'd be a little bit raunchy. <laughs> which, which just makes me feel like more at ease with him because, again, he's just so accomplished and I have so much respect for him. But the fact that he is so grounded and so uh, uh, so kind and and so funny, it just it just makes me feel completely comfortable with him. And so I know we're gonna go, this again, this goes back to, I don't have to go to set with all these accomplished actors and feel in intimidation. I don't feel like pressure because they're all such, you know, lovely people. I feel just completely comfortable and I know I can perform and do my thing and, and not have to worry about being judged. And I think the reason I love working with Denny is because he is the most hands-on uh, with me uh, director that I've ever worked with. He's so, for one, everything, uh, every direction I get from Denny is very intimate. It's always uh, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He's not yelling something from behind the camera. He's He always comes up and we have a conversation about what he wants. And a lot of times about why he wants it. Um, and so that's what I love is because he picks up on like just the smallest little details, things that I never would have thought of. And uh, it's a look here, it's the look, look, look there, it's the way I'm walking, even like in different situations, different scenes, the way I'm walking, um, because it just, it translates into, uh, you know, effect, effects, you know, things I've had on you, like throughout this film. And he wants me to, you know, feel a certain way. If I'm feeling this way, uh, I should display it this way. And I love, because, and this is what's challenging for me, because I, as a performer, I want to get these directions and then I want to see if I can do it. You know, acting is like a puzzle for me and it's this puzzle I'm trying to put together. And he gives me pieces of the puzzle and I put them together. And, uh, and again, when I feel like, uh, when he's happy, I know I've uh, accomplished something. I, and I feel, again, it just, I feel like he's making me a better actor. And I think it's because, again, I, it's uh, all those little subtleties and the intimate conversations we have. And uh, so, and there's, you know, there's really something special about that for me, and I think you'd have to understand like how I got into this business, where I started, and to be here now. Even my part in Blade Runner, I had to really uh, win Denny's opinion, um, or win his favor for that, because originally he didn't want me for the role. He then he thought it was all wrong for the role, and it took some doing to get him uh, to approve me for that role. And again, that felt like an accomplishment, if I can, you know, uh, prove myself with a director like Denny Villeneuve then that says something that says you know, something to me of you know how far I've come and so now being here um, and just again we're just he really trusts in me and he believes in me uh, as an actor and he's told me like in the first film he told me because I was self-conscious and he wanted me not to be and he said you're a very strong actor and it just like for him to say something like that to me just it means everything to me this is this is why I'm in this. Like this, I love acting. Like I'm obsessed with acting. Uh, I have been since the first time we tried it, and I failed miserably. I was just horrible. And this is why I wanted to become a better actor. And so now, t from going to there, where I was sitting in my first scene in the first my first film, and being mortified at how bad I was, to now being on this, you know, the sequel to Dune, and working so uh, uh, up close and personal with a director like uh, Denny Villeneuve is just. It, it says to me how far I've come. Rebecca, I had a I had a chance to have some scenes with her, which in the first one we didn't have, and uh, we had. A, I mean, she's a fantastic actress, and also she's very funny. She makes me laugh a lot, and uh, she is uh, very easy to work with, and and I think she's bringing a depth and a complexity to the role that it's very well uh, put together. Rebecca just did incredible work across the movie, but even uh, just in the scene where, um, in the moments after she becomes the Reverend, or after she does the Water of Life uh, process, and I wasn't on set those days, but I was fortunate enough to get to see the, the footage. I mean, there's the there's an element in her physical performance there that's 
multidimensional and very different than what Jessica's going through in the first movie. And then there's a sort of stillness and regality to who, the, who Je Lady Jessica becomes as the Reverend Mother of the Fremen that once more is entirely different from the work she was doing in the first one and super impressive and brings a much, just a very important element to this film. I love her. I just think she was one of the best things in, in the first film. She, she blew me away when I saw the film. She was a standout for me. Um, I thought what she did was extremely powerful, very, very open, very human, um, very believable. Um, yeah, so working with her is, um, is a pleasure, you know, because you get to see, it's not very often, you're with people, we were talking about it earlier with different actors, you know, the coming to terms with myself at 45 was realizing that I was a film geek and that it was okay to be a nerd. Do you know what I mean? And I do, I love cinema and I love film and I love storytelling and I love, you know, anything that revolves around the human condition and what challenges that and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's what I see in her. You know, she's one of those actresses that has, she can tap into the idiosyncrasies that most of us can't really see and then she exploits it through her acting. And it's, uh, she's a special actress, man. The expectancy of this one is the first one was so well received and we all loved it so much so I think we all went in with just sizzling expectations and we come back to recognized locations but it's newer it's bigger it's grander it's it's everything it was and more when I found out that we literally pick up from where we ended that for me was the ultimate continuation I sometimes find it hard when time has passed because you always wonder what has happened to characters, but here the audience and us as characters and as actors, we get to actually pick up from where we ended and just continue the arc of the character, um, which is wonderful. So we literally start at the end, at the beginning. But I think what's interesting is there was a, um, a switch of character for me, that's how I recognized it, from being this Bene Gesserit protecting mother to the journey of Paul and him taking in charge and Paul's decisions and Lady Jessica who's at this point lost her entire planet, her people, her husband or her partner. There couldn't be more of a vulnerable state of being and then being cast into the unknown, chosen by Paul to walk into it. It's a, it's a very hostile environment where all of her tentacles are constantly on display. We spoke mostly about Jessica's transition into the Reverend Mother, because I was curious about how he saw the portrayal of, um, of a character who knows so much, yet has to have the subtleness of feeling um, vulnerable. Because I always find it interesting to dig into the vulnerability and the fact that She's constantly aware of her children. Something that I kept on saying to Denny is, the mantra that I sit on for her is, I know that my path is correct, but I can't push a prophecy. Everything that happens has to take its time. So it's a game of tolerance. Uh, so we spoke a lot about that because I'm eager as Rebecca. I'm eager, I'm eager to portray this. I'm eager to show this, I'm eager to. And he kept on saying, it's sitting back. It's letting everything unravel in front of you and then taking decisions based upon the way the prophecy is moving in front of you, if that makes sense. But there are two separate entities with her. For me, it is when she is the Reverend Mother, which is most of the film, and when it is prior to it. Those are two separate uh, characters. Even though she's a Bene Gesserit, she's so enlightened with knowledge. And then on top of it, I, there's a very a calming sense of stability with her. It's a constant stillness. And it's, it's the idea that when words are spoken, she is 400 dimension past that. Uh, so whatever I need to do to get into that mindset, but then also trying to take all of that and shake it off and just make her as relatable as possible because I find characters who are relatable, even if they have superpowers, and extraordinaire, much more interesting. Um, there's a beautiful evolution between them, and uh, Timothy and I 
often speak about. We had a wonderful scene the other day when uh, Jessica is sent um, south and Paul and Charney and everyone else are going to fight in the, in the north and we have our different reasons and obstacles and we, we support each other but we're also completely each other's opposites at, throughout the film. And there's a moment where I just saw the way that Timmy was playing it and I, I had read it completely differently and he had taken it to such a mature level where it wasn't blame culture and where it wasn't this youthful, boyish development. It was rooted in understanding and the acceptance that he knows his mother is a fundamentalist and a full believer. And how he takes it and what journey he decides to go on is, is you know, the choice he does. But just those little moments are wonderful. I mean, this cast is ridiculous. Um, and as you know from doing many interviews, quite often we are all in the same film and we don't get to meet. Like Lea Sadu, for example, we've never met in this film. Our paths don't cross. Um, whilst, thankfully, Christopher Walken and I got Florence Pugh as well, and Austin Butler. It's just wonderful. It's not the fact that you get stuck in a wheel of, of recognition, but what you do. I know the characters. I know Paul. I know, you know, Charney more and more, and Gurney and Stilgar. It's sort of, it's characters, and they're rooted. And here comes four, five fantastically new, brilliant actors delivering something completely unique. And you just know that all of us together are going to make something phenomenal. But I was very drawn to Christopher Walken and I was drawn to Charlotte Rampling. I like stories. I would ask them questions and they would, it would be story time for me. And then gradually more people would come and sit and it was like sort of fire night, bonfire night with, with storytelling. All we needed was marshmallows and a stick. What a cast. No, it's what's cool is uh, when you see Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin and Stellan Skarsgård giddy about returning to a role. And I think all those guys, definitely those guys, have been parts, have been a part of hugely successful franchises, sequels like Pirates of the Caribbean and Avengers and, um, and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So uh, they were giddy, you know, and like little kids in a candy store. And I have so many funny videos of Josh, I think I could put together a documentary. Stilgar makes this presentation in part one, and in part two, now he brings Paul and Jessica into his world, into Arrakis, and he's the one to present the reality of his tribe, of his people, of his, uh, of his needs, of his circumstances to Paul. And the role is, is very, uh, very um, complex now, and uh, and I love that. I love to work with that complexity. And it has humor, has, has depth, has uh, command, and also has some sensitivity, sensitivity about what, what, what are his needs. No? Doom Part 2, it's about the journey of Paul, the character of Timothy, uh, coming of age and becoming the man that is going to lead us to a better world but with a lot of complexity and contradictions within that journey. I think Timothy is a very talented actor. Uh, I can see the difference between part one and part two uh, in the sense that he knows, he now owns the role in a different way, which is beautiful because that's what the movie is about as well. In the first one is in the introduction. It's a world that opens in front of him and now he owns, he has to own that world. And he, as an actor, he's so elastic and flexible. And he can jump from drama to comedy, to depth, to light in a second. And it's beautiful to see that uh, near him. It's beautiful to be in front of him and see his process. And also being so young as he is, it's great the energy that brings into the set. It really puts you up in a, in a great, in, a, in one of the greatest moods. The, the good thing with Josh and I is that we, we know each other for so long and, and we were pinching each other like, man, we are here, we are working together, we're still making the job that we like, we are blessed and, and, and we are here with this amazing team of people. So we are very aware and 
we were celebrating every moment out of it. It's a long shoot, it's a long film, it's a long shoot. And I think for me, now that I'm getting older, for me it's clearer and clearer. It's about the captain of the boat, the energy that he brings, in this case, the Nibelan. And he's such a wonderful, caring, uh, beautifully creative and generous person that there is no room for any of the other things. So everybody's really here doing their best because they are happy. They feel protected. They feel welcome. They feel heard. They want to be part of it. They're excited. And you can tell that on the crew, behind the camera, and in front of the camera. And that makes the job way easier, way funnier, and way better. And I would say everybody has to do with it, but especially Denis Villeneuve. I think Denis Villeneuve is, uh, is one kind of director that uh, I don't know how to express it. I don't know because I, I adore him, I love him. I, uh, I am so grateful that he gave me the chance to be part of this adventure. And at the same time, he's creating this mastodontic world. But when you are shooting, actually, I don't know how he does it. You feel like you're doing an independent movie. I mean, the camera is there, the crew is there, but it's like, okay, let's get back to work. Let's do the thing. Let's just focus on this. Let's create together. Let's experiment with things. Let's try this, let's try that. And then you forget about the surroundings, the huge machinery that is behind this big movie. And you take the creative journey as an actor. And that's beautiful because otherwise you would have thought, oh, is this going to be too much of a weight under my shoulder when they say action? No, he's there to make sure that you are doing your thing, which is create freely with pleasure, with joy. Still Suit is great. It's amazing, the wardrobe and uh, I mean, the, the costumes in this movie, as it was in the first one, it's, it's insane. I mean, whatever you look at, it's like the details, the tiny details are amazing. So when you, the first time I put back the Still Suit, it was like, oh, wow, here it is. I, I felt that it was a little bit overweight. <laughs> like, oh, no, it's tighter than three years ago. But then I start to lose weight and it fit better. And it was fine as soon as, as, soon as we were uh, doing in, in tears on sets. But when we came out here with the steel suit, that was a different game. Um, and still, it's not as bad as I was expecting. I mean, it's hot, but it's, uh, it's, it's manageable. You can do it. <laughs> the knee is a strong believer on shooting things with the camera rather than too many digital world. And you can tell that in the way he shoots it. And, and, uh, and, and I appreciate, we all appreciate that because it puts you right in the place. In the dunes, in the desert, in the, in, in the sandworm. I mean, it's not real, the sandworm, but the thing that they have created, it's so real and realistic and the way it moves and it, that makes you feel, oh, wow, I have a good glimpse of what it could be to be in, on top of that monster. Uh, and, and he, he likes the things to be simple, but real. And, and that's beautiful for an actor to be part of that. I think part two is more complex, wider, has more action than the first one, which it was kind of a, an introduction to the world. In this one, we develop those worlds. We develop those characters. We bring them to contradictions, to, to thoughts, to emotions, to encounters. Uh, uh, and it's more emotional. And I think it's, visually speaking, it's gonna be, I don't know, I don't know what's the word. I, I, it's so big, it's so out of my understanding. I don't know what's the word to say in English. It's gonna be um, uh, outstanding. Because what I see on a little monitor, still being the monitor, I go, what is that? Uh, I think that's what it's going to happen in this second part. People are going to be blown away. Oh my God. So my first three days of shooting were in June um, in Italy. And I had three days with Lea Sedu and Charlotte Rampling. And it was just the most unbelievable three days ever. It was like stress-free set, just acting, just acting all day, all night for three days with these two mega women that I have looked up to for such a long time. And they truly are like, creme de la creme of, of, uh, of the women that I really, really bowed down to. Um, and that was just in its own 
since uh, I, that was like one of my, my peaks of my career, being with them too for three days. And then of course I'm hanging out with Christopher Walken for two weeks, um, which uh, again, you just look to your left and there's Christopher Walken who's acting with you. And um, you just have to keep on reminding yourself that this isn't normal and I should not get used to this. <laughs> Well, the House of Atreides is, has been has been annihilated. I mean, one of the great, great houses of many, many centuries. It's just in overnight. It was we, we learn this right at the beginning of the film, not not in visual, but we learn it through a narration that it's been that it's been eradicated. So there's a whole massive shift in what could be happening. He brings a poetic and philo philosophical sense to the story, which you do get in the reading of. Obviously, Frank Herbert's, which I think is why it's very, it's very powerful to people, because it's, it's also very interior, and it's very, the, the imagination is, is of a hugely poetic nature, and I think Denny is able to get this in, in his visuals and in his narration. He's able to get a kind of uh, a mystery about what is happening. It's, it's, it's on an operatic scale. That was a, that was a treat to work with Florence and Leah because they're. It's another generation from me, and it's like it's it's two young two young women who, who also have, very, one is not part of my my Bene Gesserit set. So Leah has part, so I've I've been training Le Leah, and she, so she's part of my world. And then Irulan is part of another world, but I'm very influential in her life. So it, it was all it was sort of my, like my two beautiful pupils you know, that I was that I was gazing on to make sure that control that I had was sufficient. Stellan and Dave are both, they're both such sweet and uh, funny guys and then they're playing such nefarious characters. <laughs> so they, uh, they're they very much, uh, we just had a blast because you know, you, you, you're doing things that uh, we as ourselves can look at from the outside and see it's, it's villainous, but, uh, but then you're justifying it when you're in the moment, uh, but they're, there wasn't really any, they, it wasn't, uh, they didn't really give me advice in that way, but they, they more just welcomed me with open arms and were very, uh, very kind to me. It's weird to even call him Christopher. I feel like I should call him Mr. Walken. He's just, he's, he's my hero. He's, he's a legend. He's, um, uh, he's been a part of some of my favorite films of all time. And, and, um, and, and then to just get to watch him on set and see how he works, it has just been glorious. I, uh, and on top of that, he's, he's a hilarious and very kind guy, so we've, we've had a blast. I remember the first time I had to play a king. I said to another actor, I said, how am I gonna play a king? You know, I'm from Queens and, you know, and, and uh, you know, I grew up in the neighborhood. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, the king is seen by reflection. He said, you'll be a king by the way people treat you. And I thought that was wise, and, and I thought about, thought about it with this, that I didn't have to try to be the emperor, that I just rely on Denis and, and the, the beautiful sets and costumes, and that if people treated me like the emperor, then it'd be okay. So that's how I approached it. That, that it's stunning. It's, it's, uh, Exciting, it's beautiful. On the terrific actors in the first one, and a lot of them are in this one. You know, actors that I like to watch all the time. Well, he's, you know, he's a brilliant man, and he's got all this uh, experience and, and technique. He really knows how to do it. And uh, I, you know, there's a few times you work with directors and you feel that you're really in good hands. You know, you feel that they've, they've got it all, you know, right here. And that, uh, you know, that you're okay. Everything's very, it's a very uh, good, secure feeling. It's honestly a dream come, a dream come true for me. I, it's my first big international movie. Uh, I watched the first one in theater on a big screen. 
And when I had the call from Denis telling me that I was, that he offered me the part of Shishakli, was for me, I couldn't realize it. I didn't believe him at first. I remember um, Francine Meisler, the di uh, casting director, calling me and said, listen, Denis wants to have a chat with you about a character in Dune. I was like, this is not happening. This cannot be true. I was really, I, no, honestly, I couldn't believe it. And then I remember Denis organizing, uh, Francine organizing this call with me. And I remember on my screen, I saw Denis Villeneuve is trying to call you on Zoom. And this is not happening. This is not happening. And also because I love Denis so much as a director, I'm a fan of him. She, he's one really of my favorite directors. And, and also because I never had this kind of experience before. I, so when he called me, I was really, really nervous. And I even didn't listen to him when we had a call because I was like all over the place. And yeah, so it was really, and I didn't audition also, you know. He called me direct and, and tell me, listen, I have this new character called Shishakli. She's gonna be a fireman. She's gonna be Shani's best friend. Um, and I'm like, okay, Shani is Zendaya. Paul is Timothée Chalamet. And there's Javier Bardem. I was like, okay, this is my job. I'm a professional. And he said, listen to the script, uh, 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 read the script and, and, and see how you feel about it. I said, okay, sure. I'm gonna read the script and tell you what I feel. And yeah, of course I was really, really excited. And yeah, I was really happy. I had a physical training and of course the Chakapsa lessons, the language that the Fremen are speaking. And also I think Shishakli also was created with her look. I mean, she got tattoos, one here and under the hand. And when, when I wore the steel suit, I think everything, and with the Chakopsa, because she speaks a lot of Chakopsa in the movie. So I think all of this made her, made her, <laughs> made her who she was. I mean, it's really impressive for me to watch her becoming Shani. Um, I mean, she's really serious and very sensitive about She's, I think she's a very beautiful shiny. It doesn't make sense what I'm saying, but when Shani Sha and Shikshakli are together, we have, they have their own personality. And Shani is, is this sensitive, tough, discreet, and very powerful girl and very smart. And Zendaya is a shiny. <laughs> I mean, she is kind of in her life. Tim is a, I mean, also, as every actor, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of his work. I love uh, Timothy as an actor, and so I was very curious to see how he's doing on set. And Timothy loves his job so much. He loves being on set. He's very joyful, he's smiling. He has such a contagious energy. He's smiling all the time and he's working every day. He's working so hard and he's very focused. Um, I, yeah, it's also for me very interesting to see him work. And also with Denis, their relationship that they create, they really like collaborate together, which is very, I mean, it's necessary, of course, because he's there every day, but yeah, he's a, it's very nice to work with him. He's very, he's a light, he's, yeah. Well, I haven't worked that much with Rebecca and Josh, but I can say that I love them both so much. Rebecca, she's one of the funniest person I've ever met. I think she should do comedies more because she can do everything, of course, but she's a really, really funny. And with Josh, uh, we created this beautiful brother, sister, relationship and he welcomed me right away I mean but everyone um, since the day one is my first shooting day everyone welcomed me it was so easy for me to fit in <laughs> because of them they made me feel very 
welcomed and Josh, he was very, very sweet to me and he's also a very funny guy. And if I have a problem or if I don't feel good, he's always here to listen and he's a very, very good friend too, yeah. It's a long movie, it's a long shooting. We are, we started like five or for some people six, seven, eight months ago. So it's very important that we connect to each other and that we have, that we build like a team that we can trust and yeah, and also because we're all sleeping in the same hotel and we're all together, it's very nice. So we can not only have a good relationship on set, but also when we're back to our lives. <laughs> I don't know if I'm very clear about it. No, that makes sense. But makes sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. And also with the Fremen Patrol, um, I mean, they become, they become really good friends. And yeah, I think it's important because it's very hard. And for me, it's the first time uh, that I'm doing such a big, big movie, the biggest movie. <laughs> so it is not easy um, every day, um, even if I feel so grateful for, uh, for, uh, for being here. But yeah, I think, but also I think it's because of Denis. Denis bring this energy. He's, I mean, because he's so kind and, and he's sincere and he cares about everyone, about the actors, of course, but also about the crew, about the props, about the, he cares really. So he bring this energy that made us feel um, warm and, and comfortable. It's, I think a lot of, yeah, it's because of him that we're, I feel very, very lucky um, to work with him. Also because he's so passionate about Dune, about the story. Um, I mean, it's his dream movie. That's what I've, someone told me. <laughs> um, he, uh, someone told me that when he was a kid, he had the book on the side of his bed and he said once, I don't know, he was like maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. And he said like, I'm gonna do this, a movie. I'm gonna write Dune once. I'm gonna do it like a movie. So it's, so we can see it on set. He's very passionate. He loves the characters. He loves Paul Atreides. He loved the Harkonnens, he loved. So watching him being so involved and also very calm <laughs> because it's such a big production. It's, he has so much work and every day he comes and set and he knows what he wants to do. He knows everything he is in, in his mind and he's, he has the scene in mind and he creates the scene the way he wants it. And he's very, precise and, and, and he's a funny, very funny guy. Everyone is so, so nice. Um, and for me, it is just the biggest dream. Even my dream weren't as beautiful as working here. And again, I remember my first day, my first line the first time I've met the crew and Denis telling and voila um, she Shackley is born it was very very special to me I was okay this is real this is happening I'm working on Dune it is it is big for me you know I come from Switzerland <laughs> nobody in my family is in the movie industry it's like I'm working with this those amazing actors and I didn't tell them before because I'm, I'm trying to be professional. I'm trying to be as professional as I can. So I'm on set. I'm not showing that I'm such a fan of so many people here. I mean, even if it's Greg or, or Denis or also the guy who works in special effects, who won Oscars and Hans Zimmer is in the, the music and, and Zendaya and, Javier, everyone, I mean, 
I'm a fan. I'm I'm a fan girl. I am, but I don't want to show them yet. I'm gonna tell them one day, but I. It's. It is huge for me. It is really huge. I have no words to tell <laughs> to tell them how grateful I am to be here. I'm gonna thank Denis. I mean, for me, it's like. I could die now. I mean, I did, I did June, so it's okay. It's what I want to say is whatever it takes you to this film, whether you want to watch it because of, a, because of an actor or because of you like June or because you're a fan of Denis Villeneuve, um, my advice is to, to go and watch this movie in a big screen in theaters because I think I really do that this movie is going to be epic everything is in that movie it is it is explosion I mean it's it is going to be wild yeah cool. I wonder if it mirrors the person who Denny is when it comes to the cast or if it's the fact that people become something different when they're on a set with Denny because there, there are no selfish egos who destroy an environment. It is, it's so friendly, it's so kind, it's, everyone holds space for each other. Everyone has a possibility of being who they are and feeling safe in being who they are and what they want to deliver. Um, and that is unique. And it doesn't mean that these people who are here aren't extraordinary, they are. But I, I really do think there's something about how Denis creates an environment. So Denis and I had these conversations. D Denis has a fetish for fabric. I'd like that to go in a loop. Uh, Denis will put a headdress on and a dress, then a cape that has a hood, but there's something missing. And it's always an extra piece of fabric. And then he goes, mm, no, 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 there's something else. Then another piece of fabric, and then to kind of put a cherry on top, then it's a piece of fabric over your head. And as an actor, you don't want to cover your face, because then it can be a stunt person in there. But he always finds a moment to get some light in there. You know, Greg just makes it worthwhile. But they're fucking fabrics. It is so heavy, and then you look at it and it looks otherworldly. This is Denny. He just creates this shape. It's not perfect. It's timeless. It reminds me of, of the, do you remember Arrival? You know those big um, alien creatures? That's the shape. It's constantly bridged. Um, so I do it for him. I will cover my face for him. If we live in a society that grander and bigger is the best word to describe something developing, it isn't. It can stand still. It's storytelling. It's brilliance within the calm. It's moments. It's the locations. It's being able to go into the incredible Wadi Rum desert and find new angles, new sets, sharp edges. It's, it's everything that was that you can expect, but it's a different story. I, I advise people to see the first film, but you can come in and see the second film and it's a freestanding entity. That is a master who can go from small to big to small to change. It's unexpected, it's emotional, it's catharsis at its best. Denis is he's really an exceptional person. He, he is so... Uh... He's so kind and thoughtful in his collaboration. He really listens and, um, and he won't just go straight to an answer if he doesn't have it. He'll, uh, he'll tell you that he wants to dream on it and then he'll dream on this and, and come back with some vivid, um, detailed, rich uh, reason for whatever he, his vision is. And, um, and he's just, he's, he's really a true genius. I mean, when you watch him at work, it, it's, uh, it's really, 
I feel like I'm on set with Kubrick or something. It's, I just feel so incredibly in awe of him every day. Um, and he makes it look easy. He's just so sweet at the same time. It's really it's such a, a nice thing to get to be around. And then the other thing that I didn't realize is how funny he was. He's, he's really got such a sense of humor. The Atreides fight different than the Harkonnen, fight different than the Sadakar, fight different than the Fremen. Um, so that was really special to see and also to watch them kind of implement those styles and learning those styles. Um, what makes a Fremen fight different than any other fight, you know, their, their ability to work in the sand and how they move their bodies and how they, um, how they crawl and, you know, it's, it's really, it's really interesting um, to start understanding within my own body. Um, so that was cool. Um, we did like a lot of crawling <laughs> uh, techniques. Um, you have to be very light on your feet if you're gonna be a Fremen, very smooth. It's really, really magical. And again, there's, there's concepts and there's ideas that are kind of so far out a little bit that um, I even wonder like how, <laughs> how is Denny gonna be able to explain this and like make this make sense to, to someone who may have never read the book? or have only seen the first movie. Um, but obviously, he did it with the first movie. I think he'll, he'll do it again. Um, I think something that I felt when I watched the first film was I understood the books more somehow. Like, I'd read the books, and I still had questions, and I still was confused about things. And then when I watched the movie, I was like, oh, that makes more sense now. Like, he made it so clear and built this world. And so now I think he's just having fun. Like, you can see he shows up every day and I think no matter how tired he is or anybody else is, like they just feel so, I think, um, reinvigorated by his energy because he comes on set and he's so positive and he's so excited because this is, I think, in many ways, a childhood dream of his, you know, and he's fulfilling that. And it's almost like watching like a, a kid, you know, there's such, and I think being able to tap into that, like that creative essence that the child part of ourselves has is so special and so important for creatives. So it's really cool to watch him kind of tap into that and explore that and just feel so much joy. Like he'll finish a scene and he'll be so moved and excited. And you know, I think we all feel the same. I'm still pinching, pinching myself that I had the, the privilege and the chance to bring Dune to the screen. I, um, it was, the biggest challenge of my life because it's very dangerous to tackle your childhood's dream. I'm pretty proud and there's a lot of moments that are very close to the images I had in mind when, uh, when uh, I read the book uh, as a kid. You know, it's very moving for me. Hans and I share the same passion for the book. We both read the book when we were young. We have the same kind of history. Uh, uh, Hans was the first artist that joined me on part one and he was the first artist that, artist that joined me in part two. It started, uh, I would say that uh, the part two started as uh, what, six months after Dune release, Hans was still composing, was still scoring the movie. I was like sometimes receiving music and say, Hans, the movie is in theater right now and you're still standing me music. He said, yeah, 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 but it's not that. You understand, I want you to be inspired for part two. I want you, I, I cannot stop right now. I'm, I'm, just listen and it will inspire you for when you're gonna write and blah, 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 blah. It is definitely the best way to experience doing part two in IMAX. Why? Because IMAX is definitely the most immersive format you can find. And uh, it has the ability to create very strong intimacy but also tremendous scope. And uh, 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 I recommend strongly to, if you want to see the full power of Dune, you should see it in IMAX. I never left the world of Dune. Um, in fact, I think, I think Denis thought I was quite mad because I kept writing after we finished the movie. But because I knew, I knew the story, I knew the book, I knew it was coming our way. And in fact, I, uh, one, of, one of the main themes in this movie was written at the end of the first movie. I was standing up at Warner Brothers and Denis came up to me and we were just talking and he very quietly said, have you ever read a book called Dune? 
and I sort of, uh, you know, I became one of those little dogs that goes a little wild, right? Um, I think I frightened him. Denis is an, is an extraordinary human being, first and foremost, and secondly, an extraordinary director. And then he managed to do some magic tricks. You know, the, the internal monologue I was talking about that is so uncinematic. He managed to figure out how to go and give you that, that side of the story um, with, without doing voiceover and stuff like that. Um, you know, he, 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 he is an amazing filmmaker. He's an amazing... Uh, so he, he, made, he made it into a film as opposed to a talking book. I never understood why a film set in, in, on, on some strange planet in the future should use, uh, you know, a, the, the, your normal um, romantic middle, uh, middle European orchestra, you know, why, why am I suddenly hearing violins, you know, this, this, this all seems to be wrong. So we built, we, we started building instruments and we started designing instruments. People love criticizing this town about its brutality and about its callousness. You know, I don't think I've ever worked with anybody who is quite as as as, as considered as a human being as to me. You know, and I think every, every everybody, you know, when you, when this room is full, you know, when full of musicians and full of sound designers and full of, you know, everything that, you know, everything we're throwing in it and, you know, and Denise in this room, I know that everybody in this room would do anything for him, you know, because in a funny way, I know he would do anything for us, you know, so it's, you asked me what was it like to come from the first movie to the second movie? Well, it was coming back to the family. At the end of the day, I think, I mean, look, I know, I know, I've done this for 47 years, this movie thing, writing music for movies, and I, I, it, the thing that never has changed is I, I, I always write for the people that are going to go and come and see this movie. I always try to do them justice. Uh, you know, I, I, I try not to take, you know, be cheap about things. I, I remember Ridley Scott saying to me once, um, sentimentality is second-hand emotion. I always thought oh, that was really good. So if you write, for instance, an emotional theme, make it an emotional theme, don't make it a sentimental theme, you know. Give it a bit of class. This collaborative process whereby Yes, I write the music. I write the music, but that's that's only a fraction of what we're doing. You know, it's it's. I I see it much more as a, dire, a directorial role. You know, if you think about what a director does, I mean, especially somebody like Denis who writes as well. You know, sits in the cutting room, obviously knows how to edit, um, obviously knows his cameras, obviously knows his light, obviously knows how to persuade his actors. Um, so many things you know, are going on and, I, I, and at a certain point when we're all in this room and we're talking about music, you know, my musicians, my technicians become my actors. I'd love to talk to you about Pedro because, because here's the thing, you know, we were talking about super duper computers and super duper science and synthesizers and you look around this room and it's full of machines, etc. And then comes in Pedro, and he plays you something beautiful, and I'm going, what's this instrument? He goes, oh, I went to the plumbers. It's PVC, it's PVC piping that they actually use in toilets. Um, and I've built this instrument out of it, and it, this happens all the time. Denis was very nervous showing this film because it was very unfinished. He didn't know me. And I started to play, and he just said, oh, that's what I heard all along. And we never needed, we've said a lot of things since then, but in a funny way, 
That was probably the most important statement we made to each other. I, in the language of music, and he in just going, yeah. That's what I imagined. I like them to hear the music, but I would like them to not be that aware of it. I would like them to be aware of the whole, the complete experience. Because the first time Denis showed me the film, actually, um, I kept having this experience where something new and original was happening. And I'm going, oh, that's pretty great. And then two minutes later, something new and original was happening. And he kept, he kept upping the ante to Denis and me. Somehow this book, you know, and we're not talking about Kafka, Goethe, Shakespeare, Chaucer, um, James Joyce. We're not talking about, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the canon of great world literature. We're talking about something completely different. We're talking about something that got under our skin when we were teenagers. And, and when, we were, when we were working on it, it took us back to that time. And it took us back to the purity of that time. And I think, look, we, we, live in an, <laughs> we live in an interesting world, which is turning. You've been outside today? It's turning more and more into the desert planet. Um, so, but, but that's sort of, even, even that is, is vaguely beside the point. It's, um, it just, it gripped us and never let us go. And it's been an incredible journey. I feel like we never quite, uh, it never quite ended. It just felt continuous from the first film into our journey through the Oscars and then straight into prep. Timothy is hands down one of the best actors of his generation and he really um, completely inhabits the character now who has been, um, had this leadership role thrust upon him and he becomes, he becomes everything that he has the potential of in the first film. Um, we see him wrestling with what destiny his mother and the Bene Gesserit have for him. And Timothy does a beautiful job of, I think, humanizing all of that intensity and complexity. And you really feel him wrestling with it in a way that I think is very relatable. Although certainly none of us um, necessarily have those powers or abilities, I think we can all relate to uh, trying to be the best version of ourselves and again who we want to be versus what the world wants us to be. Zendaya is such a multifaceted, talented actress. She's arguably one of the best of her generation. She brings a vulnerability as well as a strength. Chani is uh, a warrior unlike anyone else. You see her on the front lines. She is at the same time very much the heart and soul for Paul and puts Paul through his paces in terms of really um, earning her love. Rebecca's brought an incredible intensity to Lady Jessica. This is the culmination of everything that, that Lady Jessica has been uh, raised to do as a Bene Gesserit. This is the ultimate for her. This is the ultimate mission. She believes deeply that Paul is the Kwisak Hadrach and she will stop at nothing to make sure that he fulfills that destiny. Fade is the nephew of the Baron, played by the, I will say it again, one of the very best actors of his generation, Austin Butler. The character is psychotic. He truly takes pleasure in, in killing. He is a master, master swordsman. Uh, we see him for the first time in the, uh, in the gladiator pit. And for him, the ultimate power is to get Arrakis, and he is given this gift by his uncle, who also believes that perhaps he's the only person who can ultimately bring victory and control. Leah Seydoux, an incredible actress, it plays Lady Fenring. She's a Bene Gesserit who has a very specific mission and 
is probably one of the only Bene Gesserit who could actually come in and figure out how to how to control and bring Fade into what becomes the ultimate um, power play for the Bene Gesserit. Because as we know, they don't really pick sides. It's all about the bigger chess game. And so for them, Fade Rotha becomes the one who they believe can carry through what is their ultimate agenda. One of my favorite moments in the film is when Gurney and Paul are reunited. It's a surprise, it's unexpected, it's incredibly emotional. We left it, um, it was unknown what happened to Gurney in the first film. And for Paul, the, the loss that he believed, you know, between losing his father, Duncan Idaho, Gurney, he believes, is dead. And so this moment that they find each other, which again feels like destiny, is a, a huge turning point in the film. And right at the moment that Paul is wrestling with what he's going to do with his power. Josh is, he's incredible. It's, it's hard to imagine this film without him and just his energy and his commitment and he brings a lot of humor to the film. And Gurney is such a, um, such a true and loyal uh, character that it's impossible not to root for him. It's hard to imagine anybody else directing this movie. This film works or needs to work on so many different levels both on an intimate character level, as well as on a giant, epic, um, made for the big screen. We shot the entire film in IMAX. And I think there's very few filmmakers who are able to work on both levels as effortlessly as, as Denis is able to. And he's a master world builder. And he, he has a way of making a world that is very foreign feel incredibly relatable and very real. So much of that is done um, in camera, uh, which is very important to Denis, and the level of detail, whether it's you know the costumes, uh, the set design, all of all of those details coming together to to form something that feels organic and real. So the film does not feel off-putting in any way. Denis done a beautiful job of, in some ways. Um, melding genres, and what I mean by that is the film is very much a gritty war film, while at the same time an epic adventure film, while at the same time an intense uh, Shakespearean power play uh, film, a love story, um, the emotionality and the intensity of the film is incredible and he, he blends it so beautifully together. You know, it's hard enough to do one well, but he's, he's, he's told them in, always from the perspective of character first, but they're beautifully intertwined. There's only one Hans Zimmer, deservedly so. Hans, I believe, this is setting the bar high, has outdone himself. He has created new instruments, new sounds, yet at the same time, everything feels as if it's, it's old while being new. The love theme, the first time I heard it, it's never left me. It, 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 his music penetrates your soul in ways that is hard to describe. And I think that Hans understands, he's, he's a big Dune fan, but he deeply understands how intimate the film is on one level and how epic it is on another level. And I think he's done an incredible job reflecting that in the music. I, I very much believe it starts from the top down, so that is Denis and the tone that he, that he establishes on set. I was really excited to come back on part two because part one had been such an exciting experience. Um, but I thought that I was ready for it because I'd done the first film, but it was nothing <laughs> like the first one. Um, it was just as memorable, uh, but it was such a bigger movie. Um, and we only realized it as we were making it that this, the, sca the scale, the scope was so much bigger. Um, so I would say that I was excited to come back and um, ready for what was coming and it ended up 
being more exciting than I had expected. Javier Bardem is incredible in this film. He is the father, the uncle, the friend that everyone wants. He plays um, a father figure to Paul, uh, and he's a religious believer in the Lisan al Gaib, which is, you know, the one who will lead them to paradise. But he also has a very, um, he's also very funny. Um, I think Stilgar is going to surprise people and I think people are going to fall in love with this character more than ever. Dave Padista is one of <laughs> the most generous actors. He will do anything Denis throws at him in a script. Uh, we had him hanging midair uh, out of an ornithopter. He was running through uh, war-filled fields, desert um, fields. Uh, he really would, he gets, his character gets humiliated. Dave Bautista really just went all in. Having Stellan come back, he was um, experiencing the full prosthetics transformation, but with the experience of the first film, uh, they were able to shave off a few hours of prep time. So instead of six to seven hours in the chair in the morning, he was maybe spending four to five. The character that Charlotte Rampling plays is the Reverend Mother Mohayim. And more than ever, even though she's in the shadows, she truly is the one who is pulling the strings of power. Hans Zimmer is always pushing the boundaries of music in general. He, um, for the first film, wanted to create new instruments, um, to create the sound of what music would sound like in 10,191. And on this one, he wanted to push that even further. Uh, and therefore, he developed and created new instruments or used uh, some pre-existing instruments but transformed the sounds to make um, the compositions and pieces just sound otherworldly. And he accomplished that 100%. Um, we're more immersed in Gaty Prime, this very dark planet. We feel that in the music. He really embraced the DNA of the music from the first film, um, but expanded it and and created new textures that are surprising, but also familiar. It's very artfully done, obviously. I hope audiences enjoy the ride. This film was designed with having an experience in the theater, to feel the adrenaline of going on a sand ride, of fighting the Harkonnen, of fighting um, the Sardaukar. And we worked really hard on this film and it was very satisfying work, <laughs> but we felt the adrenaline when we were on set. And I hope that people sitting in the theater will experience that same, um, that same feeling. I hope that they will be moved by the relationship, the relationship of Paul and Shani. Uh, part two, at its core, is a love story, a tragic love story. And I hope that people will embrace Paul and Shani's tragedy and be moved by what it means uh, about our world today. We made uh, so much effort to try to bring in all tiny details, the subtlety of the desert and what it is to be walking in a desert. What the desert, that's a, the, the impact on the psyche, uh, on our, your soul, of what it means to be in the desert. And even more, what it is to ride a sandworm and the exhilarating experience and the danger of such a mental mean of transport. I mean, it's like something that you can only experience on the big screen in a theater. And I strongly believe that as human, we, more, we need more than ever communal experience. We are meant to be together. And I think that cinema represents a, a beautiful moment to share stories together. And that's the most powerful way to enjoy cinema. It's huge because they're using this practical base and being able to uh, accentuate it, you know? And that's kind of the point. You know, otherwise it's like, and I did it. I did the Marvel thing, you know? And, and that was practical for me because I did that performance. But then you see and you're like, oh wow, so they've done this whole thing. And, and that was really spectacular. But there's nothing about this to me that doesn't feel, again, intimate and personal. There's not that once removed kind of awe.
It's always some version of an intimate awe, you know? Always character kind of, and that was the same thing with Sicario, it was the same thing with all those movies that Tania has done. Arrival is like one of my, it's one of those movies, I feel, I've always felt the same way about when Tom Waits was releasing albums. Like I'd hear it and I'd go, yeah, it's kind of the same. And then you listen to it again, then you listen to it again, then you listen to it again, and it just gets more brilliant and it's, gets, it's revealed the more you watch it. And Arrival, I saw it and I was like, yeah, I like that. And, and then I saw it again, and then I saw it. Now I've seen it probably five or six times. And uh, it's a f fantastic movie that never doesn't feel personal. You can't have an experience, an initial experience on a small screen with a, with a story this epic. You have to be immersed. There is no feeling that I remember that, was, that has been better or more profound to me at a young age when the lights would go down and that music would start and that first image would come up. It was, it was, it's, it's, it's a transport, you know? It's what we all want to feel. It's that magic that happens that can't happen anywhere else. You end up pausing and then you have to go get the other hand of potato chips. You know what I mean? Whereas in the movie, like, yeah, I guess it can sort of happen, but those moments in a movie that you don't, time becomes, elusive mm -hmm. and you suddenly over and you don't want it to be over because you want to stay with that experience that you've had that's a special thing that can only happen in a movie theater I always want to go back to the hardcore fans first because they are people who have been passionate about these novels for years and years and years and grew up and and reading them as Denny um, is and was and is um, but I want them to be I want them to be happy. I want them to feel satisfied that we brought these characters off the page and brought them to life for them to see the story instead of just reading the story. So I think that would be first and foremost is, you know, I, I would want the hardcore fans to really just be happy. And I think, you know, the first film has created a whole, a whole new generation of fans who maybe didn't grow up with the novels, didn't never read the novels because the, the film was so well done, so, so beautiful. And, uh, so intriguing, so I, I hope uh, that they feel fulfilled again with the sequel. And you know, I don't know if the, the universe is going to continue. I'd imagine there will, there will because there's so many stories to tell. But I really just want them to feel like, um, like I felt about Star Wars. You know, when I first saw Star Wars, it just, I mean, it, I don't know, it just opened up something new for me and it just inspired me. Um, and I want them to feel that way about these films, just, you know, to kind of be inspired. And, and uh, be so captivated and blown away by this universe that, that Denny's created. Um, and I hope that you know these movies will you know live on forever and that 30 years down the road, like I am still watching Star Wars, still a fan, still talking about it, that people will, uh, you know in the same way be talking about these films and still watching them. If there is a movie to be seen on a movie theater, is this one because of all the elements implied into it? Why? because it's an experience. It's an experience that, of course, you can have it in your cell phone or in your computer, but it only will be at the maximum of its exponents when you are sitting down with an audience in, a, in front of a huge screen. That is where this movie comes to life in a better, and in, its best, uh, in its best shape. And, when, and if you do that, you will if you see this movie on a big screen, then you will believe in movie making <laughs> for the rest of your life, I'm sure. <laughs> um, one, one is on an, on an internal level, that feeling that you get when you, uh, when you see heroes fighting for what is right and, um, and having to make difficult decisions and, and, and do what's, what's, what's best. Um, and uh, but then on on another level, it's getting to be in a movie theater and witness um, a spectacle like that. That uh, I, I I really I know how much films have meant to me, and it's so uh, 
it's uh, I'm excited for audiences to get to sit down and 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 witness what the entire crew has put together because they've all worked so hard and and it's it's really just cinematically amazing. Oh, they'll be mind blown. You can't have that many talented people making a movie on this size and this scope with as much richness and texture and um, fit, like brimming full with creativity. Uh, it can't, I mean, I hope it doesn't go wrong. <laughs> it can't go wrong. It's, um, and if it, if it does, this truly has been like the most amazing month of filming. It's a good experience. <laughs> Just enjoy escaping to another, another world. And whatever resonates with you, take that with you. Um, and think about it and discuss it. Hopefully those are, are good concepts and ideas. Maybe, you know, whether it be, um, I don't know, maybe caring a little bit more about our planet <laughs> and our resources. Um, whatever, whatever, whatever those co uh, those conversations may be, I think. But I think to me, it's just coming with an open mind and just enjoy it. Like just have fun because it's it's one of those. It's 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 quite a ride.